Right, great. Okay, so managing complications of treatment. Um, um, I'm going to hang this off just a few cases, really. I'm um, just thinking about ways to, to rather than just write a long list of complications. So um, we'll start off theoretically with a case that we've sort of touched on already. So a 51-year-old male, therefore in his prime of his life, um, who was diagnosed with CLL um, um, uh, four years ago, an incidental finding, um, his lymphocytosis progressed, doubling time of six to eight months, he's just becoming fed up with it. Um, his blood count was shown, he had widespread moderate volume lymphadenopathy. And in terms of his prognostic markers, he had a, um, um, a, a, a mutated um, IGHV sequence. His fish testing using conventional panel was normal. He had an NGS panel, which showed an um, MYD88 mutation um, with a moderate um, uh, uh, variant allele frequency. Um, uh, just in terms of significance of that, that's something that is present in about 5% or 10%. I'll be guided by those that know more than me if CLL patients and is not deemed to have a, an adverse prognosis. He was generally fed up and wanted to have treatment. So the question then came up. So we've heard about this before. So there was peers who talked yesterday um, um, about what are the options in the frontline setting. So, you know, we have access to ibrutinib, not really for this patient because he doesn't have a P53 mutation metaclaxate with a we're saying he's ineligible for FCR. And then FCR, which we're just going to spend a little bit of time talking about just to flesh out on the discussion we had previously about um, uh, the merits of this, and particularly with reference to the toxicity. Why do we consider FCR? Um, this is perhaps for anybody who's maybe younger or hasn't been through this, because there's a hit, there's a tendency when making decisions um, that things get lost in history and then forget uh, actually why we made the decisions we made in the past. Now, sometimes that's for good reason where treatment's hopeless, but actually um, FCR um, is still uh, an effective therapy. So these are data from the um, uh, CLL8 trials, this was 800 and something patients from Germany randomizing FCR with FC in a one-to-one -one, um, uh, comparison. And what this is showing is uh, 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 cumulative survival as stratified by uh, the treatment that was received and the level of MRD. And what can be seen, the bottom two curves, uh, that's for patients that the blue and the red who failed to achieve MRD negativity, or sorry, who had a very high level of MRD negativity at the end of treatment, they did very badly, but for the 50, for the um, so 63% of patients who achieved MRD negativity, um, um, they did uh, extremely well. So looking at this median, uh, median survival, progression-free survival, not reached after six years of treatment. So it's an effective treatment. Now, and then in terms of very long-term follow-up, and this is the reason why FCR question remains, I think, something that we shouldn't dismiss completely as of 2022. But as I said, we may dismiss going further, going further forward. Um, these are data on the left from the CLL8 trials, as the German trials we already talked about, and on the right from the long-term follow-up from the MD Anderson single arm trial, which looked at FCR. And this was looking at um, uh, progression-free survival um, um, as stratified in various risk groups. And what can be seen, the green lines on both, so uh, with flatting asterisks, um, in a proportion of patients, um, there is the possibility of achieving very long-term remission. And so in the, certainly on the right-hand side, the MD Anderson series, about 10 to 15% of patients um, achieve very long-term remission. So um, they were disease uh, progression-free um, beyond 12 years of therapy. Um, and um, who are these patients? Well, what can be seen above that is that they are all patients who have mutated IG, uh, immunoglobulin heavy chains and achieve MRD negativity. Although it is very difficult to pick this out at the point you start treatment, but there are a group that do well. Um, and the um, suggestion is, is they may, you know, they may be on a trajectory at least to cure, although that's not yet proven. What about the toxicity? So this is the thing that I've been asked to talk about, not the efficacy. And why do we worry about um, uh, toxicity of FCR? Well, um, these are some of the key toxicities that are observed. This is in the CLL8 trial, looking at the instance of, um, um, uh, heat of malignancy. Um, so uh, solid tumors, um, skin tumors, um, and hematological malignancy. And what can be seen here, um, is that in the FC uh, and FCR arms, there was an appreciable instance of second malignancy with six years of follow-up. And with longer follow-up, this gets worse. Um, oh, I'm now unable to. Um, and looking at short-term toxicity, um, 
uh, as seen in the same trial, the majority of patients develop grade three to four toxicity, about half the patients get grade three to four hematological toxicity. Um, so both in the short term and the long term, there are concerns about um, the deliverability of therapy, but certainly something in the short term for young fit patients, this is something that we've all used in the past and is manageable. Um, uh, these are data from the MD Anderson. They looked at a longer term follow-up in terms of what their toxicities are. About one in five patients had persistent bone marrow suppression um, 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 and about um, uh, three or four percent of patients developed um, minor dysplasia following their therapy. Um, and this is something that is important because of the fact if we look at the instance of cancer, whilst our treatment has got better and perhaps Hodgkin lymphoma is the greatest example of this, so um, uh, um, if we look at Hodgkin lymphoma, where primary therapy is extremely effective uh, with longer term follow up, the biggest risk to patients becomes their treatment rather than their disease. And we may start to see the same thing in CLL. And as treatment gets better, um, uh, duration of responses are improving, patients are living longer, but we do need to be cognizant of the potential for uh, late toxicity. So these are data from the US. So this is SEER toxicity, uh, sorry, SEER data looking at second primary malignancies, SPM, um, by um, treatment era. And what can we see here? Well, as, um, the, um, uh, as we get um, closer to the current times, um, a significant incidence of second primary malignancy seen in CLL patients now approaching 30%. Um, some of this is just because patients are living longer. There is an increased risk of, uh, of, of second cancers in CLL related to the CLL, but some of this is going to be driven by treatment. So it's an important consideration in terms of looking at long-term toxicities. We may be curing patients, but are we just setting them up um, to um, develop other, uh, to replace one, one malignancy with another? Um, <clears throat> this is the same data just shown in a different way, looking at um, second primary malignancies. Um, as a forest plot, um, so to the right of the curve, that means there's an increased um, um, uh, incidence. Um, and what can seen here is that um, from the coming down to the third panel here, uh, by year of diagnosis, a significant increase of second prime malignancies is particularly seen in older patients. So it's not just the, you know, the, the, the things that make a difference here. One is the disease, the duration of response, the age of the patient, and also the treatment. So in terms of my conclusions from this, I think it's important not to forget, we've already been reminded earlier from the question that came in, that FCR uh, remains an effective frontline therapy for CLL. Uh, there are significant short-term toxicities, so certainly not something that would be a consideration for older, frailer patients who do not fare well with this treatment, but we do need to be mindful of the potential for long-term uh, complications. In terms of how it's managed, well, there isn't really a particular um, a, a, a specific management issue here. It's all about supportive therapy and stopping treatment if you develop, if patients develop significant toxicities. Mindful of the fact that although we aim to give six cycles of FCR in the CLL8 trial, the median number of cycles of treatment delivered was between four and five. So, and this is in a young fit population. So it is a treatment that can be quite difficult to deliver. Um, but there is a significant potential for achieving MRD negativity, um, and that can occur actually irrespective of the number of cycles that are delivered. And if you get to MRD negativity and you've got a favourable um, uh, risk profile, then FCR is an effective treatment. If we move perhaps back into the real world, so away from young, fit, good prognosis patients, something that's a bit more real world. So here, a 76-year-old female patient. Um, uh, this is somebody who I saw relatively recently. She presented to the GP a number of times, feeling tired all the time, relatively non-specific, and had a blood test done. At that point, the GP examined, noticed that she had widespread lymphadenopathy. Um, her blood count is as shown. Um, she was um, somewhat anemic and thrombocytopenic, and she had a bone marrow biopsy done. Um, just to investigate the mechanism for her cytopenias, um, which showed that she had 80 or 90 percent marrow infiltration. Um, her, uh, she had um, poor prognosis disease. Um, FISH was normal, so no evidence of a um, 11Q or 17P deletion, but she had uh, germline IGHV homology, uh, and uh, her NGS panel showed that she had a P53 mutation. So poor prognosis disease in an elderly patient. Again, what are the options we can consider? FCR, we're clearly not going to be considering in this patient. 
and we have access to ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, or uh, potentially venetoclax and even atuzumab. I'm not going to talk about um, the choices here, because we've heard about that before. Piers talked about it yesterday, Helen this morning already in the context of relapse disease. But I think we could reasonably agree that she would be somebody who would be eligible for BTK inhibitor trial uh, treatment, and therefore what's the, uh, what's the optimal choice here? When thinking about BTK inhibitor therapy, and I think Neve's already mentioned this, that there are advantages of being on ibrutinib, and it's fundamentally a good treatment, but it's only a good treatment if you can stay on it. Um, and if we look here, at, these are toxicity data. These are um, data about tolerability of um, BT, of ibrutinib. Um, so um, this is um, five um, series, so some early trial data, um, single center data from um, Ohio State and MD Anderson, big US centers, uh, data from the Resonate trial, and then some real world data, which you've already heard about. This is from uh, one of Anthony Mato's series. So relatively large amounts of therapy for patients who were treated with BTK inhibitor. This is in the context of relapse disease rather than frontline therapy, but I think the assumption is, is that um, the toxicity would be uh, much the same. And what can be seen here and highlighting the discontinuation rate during to adverse events was somewhere between 10 and 40% of patients um, with at the, at the, whenever the um, cutoff was made, um, only around half the patients remained on therapy. So in the context of relapsed disease, certainly um, there is a concern about the tolerability of taking ibrutinib, particularly if, uh, in the longer term. And just do we have any data about this in the frontline setting, particularly for um, uh, in this context? So um, this was a, um, uh, a series that was presented at eHeart last year. Apologies if this is outdated. It may have been uh, now impressed, but I've not been back to recheck. So this is looking at ibrutinib in the frontline setting for patients with a P53 mutation or deletion. What can be seen top left is the treatment is effective. Um, so um, around 80% um, uh, of the patients responded to therapy, which is what might be expected. Um, and in terms of their um, overall progression-free survival uh, on the uh, bottom left, the data show that this works very well. So it's clearly an effective therapy. So the yellow line on the bottom left Kaplan-Meier chart shows that about two thirds of the patients were still in remission, um, uh, having been treated with ibrutinib in the frontline setting. Um, the concern here, though, is the, um, uh, the cumulative incidence of, um, of discontinuation. Um, and there is an appreciable um, uh, rate of discontinuation um, predominantly um, from um, adverse events. So about 30 to 40 percent of the patients stopped their treatment. Most of that was because of toxicities, um, and that had a significant impact on discontinuation. So those uh, patients who uh, progressed uh, their survival was significantly worse. Sorry, patients who discontinued therapy perhaps self evidently did not do as well as those patients who continued on treatment. Um, the toxicity, though, in terms of what is the toxicity from, um, uh, from ibrutinib, um, well, this is a pooled analysis that was published um, a couple of years ago now. And the messages that I can take from this are if this is by um, the, uh, the red line, uh, toxicities in the first year, blue in the first two years, and then um, green beyond that. And what can be seen for these specific toxicities is that it generally gets better. Most toxicities, if they occur, occur early in treatment and tend to get better. There are, however, some exceptions to this. Um, um, and what can be seen? Um, just to highlight, hypertension is a cumulative toxicity that gets worse the longer you per follow up patients for. Uh, and arthralgia, um, um, joint aches and pains is something that patients often complain about. To start off when they may be joint, it may not be dose limiting, but I've certainly had patients who just get fed up with it after a while um, of living with the side effects of the treatment. So uh, this is just to um, highlight what we've seen is that um, these are just some numbers. This is the same analysis. So significant rates of toxicity, mostly grade one to grade two. Um, uh, but in terms of grade three, four toxicities, um, uh, single figure percentage of patients developing this. Um, um, uh, quite a proportion of patients um, require treatment. 
um, and um, at variable rates of treatment resolution. So toxicity is an issue that can complicate it. It is generally mild. It's generally something that many patients can live with that does lead to treatment discontinuation in about a quarter of patients um, in published data. Not all BTKs are the same. Um, so we've already heard this from Helen's talk this morning. If we look at um, uh, some of the reasons for that, well, um, this is, uh, these are data that look at um, relative specificity for different targets, different tyrosine kinases. So uh, for those not familiar with this, this is um, the lower the number, this is looking at the minimum inhibitory uh, concentration. So a small number means that it's a more potent inhibitor. And what we can see is if you're looking at some of the drugs we've heard about, BTK on the left, um, ibrutinib has a very uh, it's extremely potent inhibitor of BTK, um, but what we can also see of other tyrosine kinases, ITK, um, something that's important in T lymphocyte function, TEC, which is important in the function of platelets, and there are others, um, that ibrutinib is relatively specific for BTK inhibition, um, but uh, does have um, appreciable inhibition of other tyrosine kinases, which what leads to some of the off-target effects. Uh, you can see here that if we're just picking out acalabrutinib, um, it um, is, has a good uh, IC50 for BTK, um, but it has almost no inhibition of ITK, um, so relatively uh, more specific. Pertabrutinib, we've heard before, um, is a very specific BTK inhibitor. So we would expect potentially to see different toxicity profiles with different drugs because of the fact that they are more or less specific for um, uh, the target of interest. And this is something that's borne out by um, uh, uh, published data. You've already seen this this morning, the Elevate RR trial, which is looking at um, uh, well, direct comparison of ibrutinib and acalabrutinib in relapsed refractory CLL for high-risk patients. As Helen's already said, um, efficacy was the same, but just to pull out, just to tease out a bit more about toxicity, what can be seen on the left-hand graph is for some of the um, uh, adverse events of special interest, um, there is a lower rate of atrial fibrillation, um, of hypertension and bleeding um, in patients treated with ibrutinib compared to with acalabrutinib rather than ibrutinib, um, some of which is due to its greater specificity for a BTK target. So just to pull out in terms of specific recommendations of how we would manage um, some of the important complications of um, uh, BTK inhibitor therapy. So we'll start with bleeding. Um, uh, there are a number of reasons whereby BTK inhibitors can cause bleeding predominantly due to its effect on platelet function. So what this cartoon demonstrates is the effects of medication on platelet function. And what you can see here is that ibrutinib has um, effects on platelet function through the interaction. So um, platelets, for those who aren't familiar with this, platelets become activated by exposure of collagen and von Willebrand's factor in damaged tissue. So if you cut yourself, endothelium is disrupted, um, structures below the endothelium become exposed and they can lead to plate activation via, via platelet receptors. And you can see here that BTK is an important part of platelet function as is TEC, which I've already mentioned, and ibrutinib as a BTK and TEC inhibitor leads to platelet dysfunction, which leads to a characteristic um, increased incidence of bleeding and bruising, which is observed in about two thirds of patients treated with ibrutinib. Um, in terms of the risk of major bleeding, so irritant bleeding is something that's very common. Major bleeding is something that is somewhat less common, but published data are variable here. So. Um, um, the trial data, so if we look at Resonate, for example, the pivotal trial of ibrutinib versus opportunity that Helen's already described, um, the incidence of major bleeding um, with ibrutinib was about 3%, um, and predominantly seen in patients who were on other anticoagulants or antiplatelet drugs, which was about 45% in that study. Some real world data, and there are more than one series that have been published, and I'll just bring out one here that's illustrative, suggests that the actual risk of major bleeding may be rather higher than that in the, uh, in, outside the context of trials. 
So in this, uh, uh, the, the, um, Cap the uh, Kaplan Monitor, this is a series that Jeff Jones published. Um, um, this is from Ohio State. This is looking at their experience also within trial, with not within trial patients. And they reported a 19% instance of major bleeding. And some of the reason for this is that their patients in the real world, there was a significantly greater instance of patients either being anticoagulated or receiving antiplatelet drugs. So it was a significant majority of the patients were had other reasons for bleeding. And what can be seen on the chart um, is that with one platelet or one anticoagulant drug or none, so this is the dotted red line compared to the blue line, um, um, the, um, most of those patients didn't have major bleeding. Um, but for the particular problem in this series was shown with patients who were receiving platelet, antiplatelet and anticoagulant drugs. This is often patients with cardiovascular morbidity, um, whereby there was a significant um, increased instance of um, uh, bleeding. So how to manage this? Well, some of it's about education. Um, um, Antiplatelet drugs, there are lots of them, including things that may not be prescribed. So it's worth asking patients, fish oil, turmeric, NSAIDs, vitamin E should all be best avoided um, in patients who are uh, treated with um, ibrutinib, unless there's a very strong reason. Life's about risk, but we do need to be thinking about managing that risk. Um, single drugs can be used. There is an increased risk, and I've certainly seen patients who've been treated with aspirin, for example, um, whereby they've ended up having to stop the treatment with ibrutinib due to a, a significant increase um, in cutaneous uh, bruising. Um, double antiplatelet therapy should definitely be avoided, um, um, and we should also avoid um, um, dual therapy with antiplatelet drug and anticoagulation. One question that comes up, I still don't know that we know the answer to this is, does ibrutinib count as an antiplatelet drug and therefore you can stop aspirin? Um, uh, what's been published recently says that you can't use anti you cannot use ibrutinib um, as a treatment for angina or risks of uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, it, uh, you'd have to treat on its own merits. Um, DOAX can be used. Um, warfarin is, remains contraindicated. Um, um, I don't have a particular um, uh, preference for one drug over another, but there is a potential risk for drug interactions, and therefore we just need to think about this in terms of the choice of drugs. So a pixaban, for example, should be used at a 50% dose in patients with um, ibrutinib because of the potential interaction. And one thing that's important is remember to tell patients, and I, get, I see this quite frequently, that patients either forget or they claim they've never been told that they do have an increased risk of bleeding and then pitch up having had a tooth taken out saying it hadn't stopped bleeding for a while. And what to do with patients who have major bleeding? Well, stop the drug is the general recommendation and then giving platelets irrespective of the platelet count um, because of the fact that you may be able to overcome um, the um, acquired platelet dysfunction um, by giving platelets in, in those patients who have life-threatening bleeding. Cardiovascular risk is another major consideration, um, and this is something that just looks at the risk of atrial fibrillation in CLL patients. So there was a large study that was published um, a few years ago from the Mayo Clinic, so they have an excellent database. So this was a few thousand patients over, over years, and they looked at their baseline incidence of atrial fibrillation um, in their cohort um, versus the general population. And what could be seen here was that there was about, um, is that this is, this is not with reference to ibrutinib or to treatment, um, that the baseline prevalence of AF in their CLL patients was um, uh, 6%, which was um, significantly more than the age-matched um, population, and then rose by about 1% per patient per year. On the right hand curve, you can see the prevalence versus the general population and at all ages, there is an increased risk of atrial fibrillation um, in CLL patients for reasons that I don't know that I completely understand. So as a baseline issue, atrial fibrillation is more of a consideration. Um, and then how do we manage this in um, CLL patients? Because um, atrial fibrillation um, is one of the significant complications that can be seen with BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, more than, um, uh, more than acalabrutinib. Um, uh, published data indicate that um, it occurs in somewhere around 10%. But as I say, some of this may just be because of the fact it's more common in CLL patients and not always treatment emergent. Well, it's important here to be thinking about the balance of risks and benefits. And so most of the guidance would suggest 
speaking to a cardiologist in terms of uh, being able to um, assess the, the necessity for anticoagulation, thinking about the relative risk of thrombosis and bleeding. And I guess many of you all will be familiar with using risk scores, the CHADS, VASC or has bled score, which this is just an illustration of an online calculator, um, which allows you to actually come up with some idea about the relative risk of one versus the other. Um, in terms of hypertension, this is also something that is a significant consideration um, for patients treated um, with BTK inhibitors. Um, so these are data that look at the instance of hypertension. This is from Ohio State. So some of this is trial, some of this is non-trial. Um, uh, they um, studied the uh, instance of hypertension in CLL patients treated with ibrutinib. And what can be seen um, with a definition of a systolic blood pressure of greater than 130, so a relatively um, a conservative definition of hypertension, was that there was a 71% cumulative instance of hypertension in their patients, which was um, more than 10 times higher than the, pack, than the uh, background population, of which about a third of those had grade three to four treatment, a grade three to four um, high blood pressure requiring therapy. Um, and what can be seen here is that the um, in terms of observed on the right hand panel observed um, over predicted, um, this is definitely appears to be a treatment effect, so um, a significantly higher rate in those patients who were treated. Um, two other things that come out of this is that in the Ohio State series, treatment wasn't desperately effective, um, including um, multi-drug um, therapy. Um, there are published guidelines that suggest how you should treat this, but um, treatment resistance can become an issue in terms of optimizing blood pressure. And the other um, um, uh, important factor here is that uh, the instance is much less than with acolabrutinib. So this is one where there is quite a big differential effect here, suggesting um, that this may not be a class effect. It's either something to do with ibrutinib um, um, specifically or due to um, some um, off-target effect that's not observed with um, acolabrutinib. So um, something that's an important consideration. And why is it an important consideration? Well, um, it's because of there are um, uh, risks of more significant cardiac issues um, in patients with uncontrolled high blood pressure. So you remember that a few years ago now, um, the MHRA issued a, um, um, a safety alert um, for uh, patients with ibrutinib, uh, risk of ventricular tachyarrhythmia. And data from the FLARE trial have uh, reported, um, uh, looked at the instance of sudden cardiac death. So. Um, the instance of sudden cardiac death, this is on ibrutinib, runs at about 1%. And this has been observed in real world data and in trials. Um, and when this was looked at in the FLARE trial, uh, what can be seen here um, is that the patients who died with unexplained cardiac death predominantly um, were those patients treated with ibrutinib and those patients who had hypertension. Um, and so I think that high blood pressure in these patients is not something to be disregarded. Uh, in those patients who've got a cardiovascular history, uh, treated with ibrutinib, have uncontrolled blood pressure, uh, they are at risk of uh, more significant treatment-related complications. So in terms of managing this, um, I, I think it's important to be aware of it. Um, uh, it's in the um, SPC for the drugs that do need to make sure patients are aware to um, um, uh, report any symptoms of atrial fibrillational palpitations and monitoring for uh, blood pressure at clinic visits, something that in a busy clinic can get overlooked. And I would just advocate using caution in patients who've got a significant um, cardiac risk factor for using BTKI, particularly ibrutinib. Um, I think that it's something that um, acolabrutinib is definitely safer, particularly from the perspective of hypertension, but um, um, atrial fibrillation is still something that can occur on therapy. In terms of treating it, beta blockers are generally recommended for atrial fibrillation for rate control um, because of the potential for drug interactions with calcium channel blockers and amiodarone. And there are standard guidance for blood pressure control, although, as I said, data from Ohio State suggests that it may be resistant to treatment if you're really trying to optimise this. As I've said before, in terms of anticoagulation, you can think about the balance of risks and benefits and the potential for interactions uh, for patients who are anticoagulated. Um, um, in terms of dose modification, question I get asked relatively frequently, should we change the dose? There's not really very good evidence about this um, to suggest that there's a good dose response relationship, certainly not for atrial fibrillation. I'm not sure of that for hypertension. As such, um, patients who have treatment emergent toxicities, cardiovascular toxicities, 
um, then uh, there is a question that comes up as to whether or not the treatment needs to be omitted um, or um, changing to an alternative um, uh, class of therapy. Moving to infections, um, infections with BTK inhibitors, it's quite complicated because there is a multifaceted way that BTK inhibitors affect the uh, immune system. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but really just to highlight some of the uh, factors that are observed. So um, there's a mixed effect of BTK inhibitors on B cells. So um, um, uh, uh, there is an immunosuppressive effect, uh, loss of adhesion and interaction, which occurs, um, but um, increased levels of IgA are fairly consistently observed. Um, in patients treated with ibrutinib um, uh, as an enhanced B cell function, which occurs later in therapy and can improve mucosal immunity. So that's a bit up and down. Ibrutinib definitely does do positive things to T cell function. Um, it skews towards Th1 differentiation. Um, what we can see with um, uh, it, it means that the function of T cells becomes improved. So more effector T cells that can do things and reduced exhausted T cells that one of the hallmarks of um, uh, CLL uh, immune function. And it improves the interaction, the so-called immunological synapse with B cells, so there's better interaction. So over time, T cell function improves. Uh, myeloid cells, um, generally their function is inhibited, um, so reduced um, function and um, um, uh, differentiation of macrophages and neutrophils. So it's a dynamic situation that occurs. And I think that my take on this is for the first year of therapy, most of the negatives outweigh the positives and therefore immunosuppression is what is observed in patients treated with BTK inhibitors and consistent with this, lots of infections um, are observed. But with time, uh, there is now a lot of data to indicate that um, um, immune function improves um, are on, uh, on with uh, extended uh, BTK inhibitor therapy. So what can be seen and what to do about it? Well, some of the common infections, um, pneumonia, as with CLL, is the most common infection that's observed, um, up to 20% of patients on ibrutinib, but trying to unpick what is due to disease and what is due to treatment is pretty much impossible, particularly in the relapsed refractory setting. But it is something that occurs mostly in the first year of treatment. As I've said, some of that has to do with the fact that ibrutinib's immunosuppression actually gets uh, I'm sorry, the effect of the improvement on the immune system uh, improves or becomes less of an issue with time. Something that I've had personal experience of, um, one of my patients who was treated with ibrutinib um, in, the, um, uh, in one of the early trials, um, um, uh, developed a, um, an aspergillus brain infection. Um, something that I really wasn't expecting at the time, um, but now certainly this is a treatment emergent, uh, this is an emergent story that there is an appreciable risk of um, aspergillus infections, particularly in the first six to 12 months of therapy for patients treated with ibrutinib um, with a propensity for CNS as well as lung infections. Some of this is also due to other therapy, particularly patients treated with steroids, but just something to be aware of. Um, pneumocystis, there are conflicting um, uh, reports about this. The incidence of infection um, is uh, in published series somewhere between 2 and 5%, and there is variable practice um, uh, with regard to pneumocystis prophylaxis, uh, which does reduce the risk, but some, uh, in some series have been considered um, unnecessary. So I do think that in terms of the take home from this is you need to be aware of opportunistic infections as well as just general bacterial infections. But um, over time, these things do tend to get better. So how to be uh, uh, manage this? Well, um, awareness is important. Thinking about infections and not just bacterial infections. Um, consider the patient um, and their risk. So thinking about what their treatment history is. Are they neutropenic? Maybe if they've had prior fludarabine, um, and are they on steroids, all of which are contributory to their overall risk of um, immunosuppression? In terms of prophylaxis, well, I know that colleagues around the country have spoken to do different things, and the guidance here is a little bit um, uh, weak in terms of um, what to do. In terms of PJP prophylaxis, um, a general rule for PJP prophylaxis recommended by the ASCO guidance is that um, you should use this for anything with a greater than 3.5 instance um, of um, pneumocystis. Published infection rates are 2 to 5% sort of around that level. 
Um, um, but as such, um, uh, given the fact there's not a, a, a huge incidence, um, um, some people advocate giving PJP prophylaxis. I do, um, but not typically beyond 12 months of therapy, um, because I think that after that it's probably unnecessary. And in terms of prophylaxis against aspergillus, it's something to be aware of. The difficulty here, though, is that um, there is an interaction between azoles and ibrutinib. It's not completely impossible to use them with dose modification. Um, but currently speaking, there are no consensus recommendations for prophylaxis, but I just say would counsel awareness of this, particularly in the early uh, part of therapy and in those patients who are immunosuppressed for other reasons. So in terms of conclusions from this, BTK inhibitors are effective. Um, it's the standard of care, particularly in this case, that we do need to consider uh, the toxicity of the therapy. Um, uh, this has been largely surpassed with the advent of access to agalabrutinib, um, uh, which has changed the way that we're treating it, but there is still an incidence of atrial fibrillation, opportunistic infections, and we do need to be aware of uh, cardiac risk factors. So third case I'll talk about, again, a sort of relatively typical 71-year-old fit patient, progressive CLL, um, who had some adverse risk factors, um, including an 11Q23 um, deletion leading to um, uh, dysregulation of ATM. Um, again, somebody who needed to get to the point, of, wants to get to the point of treatment. The options as discussed, this is somebody who you could consider FCR, but probably wouldn't because of his ATM deletion. Um, and therefore, again, choice of therapy, um, BTK inhibitor or venetoclax. The decision in this case, um, in consultation with the patient, was that he liked the idea of time-limited therapy, something we've heard of already, and was treated with venetoclax and even um, But in terms of how we manage the complications to this, I know from speaking to colleagues around <clears throat> where I work in Greater Manchester that some centres are still somewhat hesitant, even though venetoclax and ovenetuzumab have been around for a while, about the perception that it's very toxic or very difficult to deliver. And I think that, you know, in terms of taking each of the drugs, abinutuzumab does have an appreciably greater rate of infusional toxicity than rituximab, and, and particularly if you give it to patients who've got quite the burden of disease. <clears throat> but I think just to remind you about the fact that abinutuzumab uh, toxicity is <clears throat> manageable. So these are data that are actually from um, the... Um, oh, God, what's it called? Um, the st study... Um, Valentin Gerd study um, chlorambucil plus abinutuzumab um, um, in comorbid patients with um, CLL. So this is not the um, um, CLL14 venetoclax population, but what I wanted to illustrate here is that when using abinutuzumab, infusional toxicity is almost completely confined to the first dose. So two thirds of the patients getting um, a top, uh, infusion reactions of which about one in five getting quite significant infusion reactions. But if you can get through that, very little toxicity seen afterwards. Um, and in term, most of the time, this can be managed. Splitting the dose and giving an intensified steroid prophylaxis will manage this in the majority. But I think it's important just to tell the patients what they may expect um, and, to, um, uh, and, and to sit it out because it usually improves. Venetoclax toxicity, I think that people are rightly concerned about the potential for uh, chemolysis. Um, um, and this is just to remind you of what was seen when venetoclax was first introduced. This is now 10 years ago. Um, two out of the first three patients treated with venetoclax in clinical trials on the black line showing the um, uh, lymphocyte count on the blue line there, LDH. And so this demonstrates the fact that with venetoclax, and this was between 100 and 200 milligrams, this predates the uh, modern dose escalation protocol, um, you can see very, very brisk tumor lysis. And that's the important take home from this is that tumor lysis with venetoclax, if it occurs, it occurs very quickly within hours of, the, uh, hours of treatment. Um, and um, uh, you know, patients did die as a consequence of this. But I think the important thing is that uh, with a um, uh, conventional dose escalation protocol, the instance of clinically apparent tumor lysis is effectively zero. Um, 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 some patients, one to 3% of patients develop biochemical TLS, 
which can necessitate hospitalization predominantly for intravenous fluids and monitoring. But um, if this is given um, in the conventional fashion, then the risk to the patient is exceedingly small. Um, it is somewhat inconvenient, but nonetheless, I think what is important is to sort of de debunk myths about the fact that this causes um, a terrible risk of clinical um, TMS. This is just to illustrate a patient of mine that was treated some time ago. I can't remember when this was. This is a typical patient treated with um, uh, with, um, with um, venetoclax. So what can we see here? Lymphocytes in, um, in red, neutrophils in blue, and the um, uh, uh, triangle just showing the dose escalation. So a very brisk reduction in the lymphocyte count followed by intermittent neutropenia. So neutropenia is a common side effect of venetoclax, but normally responds very well to GCSF. Lymphocytes respond very briskly. And in terms of the risk of TLS, the patient developed no TLS, uh, but their phosphate and LDH wobbled, didn't require any treatment beyond oral fluids. And this is a very typical pattern. So phosphate will often go up, potassium much less so, LDH goes up, um, but um, not generally translating into um, anything that is some, um, a, a clinical issue. So while other toxicities of venetoclax, as I've said, about half the patients will get uh, neutropenia. That's the, by far the most common side effect, typically occurring in about in the first three months of therapy. And in my experience, generally responds very well to intermittent doses of, um, uh, of growth factor support. So in terms of conclusions in this, Venmo is well tolerated. Um, you'll have heard from peers that it's very effective. Um, I think it's important when thinking about Venmo to think about the trial population. So this was used in the CLL14 trial. This is a real world, real world population. So the median age was 72. Um, the median Sears score was eight. About a quarter of the patients had high risk disease and about half, more than half the patients had impaired renal function. So unlike other trials, Benno did describe a population that is of real CLL patients. Obinutuzumab. You need to think about it, split the dose. Hydrocortisone doesn't work. Give some dexamethasone or methylprednisolone, tough it out. Generally speaking, it gets better. And TLS, follow the, follow the recipe. Um, people have gone off piste with it, and there have been reported cases of uh, fatalities from CRS, but they are in the case of patients who have been treated um, not following the dose escalation protocol. And neutropenia can usually be managed. So just to close, a couple of thoughts about the elephant of the room of everybody's friend of COVID. What is the impact of uh, treatment on COVID? Well, conflicting data here. So uh, I'm just showing you some data here from a relatively large US series that was published last year about the impact of, um, um, of, of, uh, of, of treatment on COVID. Caveats here, huge numbers of them. Um, it's biased towards inpatients. All COVID data tend to uh, concentrate on patients in hospital, so we don't know the natural history of those patients who are out of hospital, presumably having much milder disease. None of these patients were vaccinated, and this is all with alpha or delta. Uh, but in this series, the demographics that um, it was about 60% treated, um, uh, in terms of those treatments, the most common uh, therapy was BTK inhibitors. And the fatality, um, severe infections, about a third of the patients died, non-severe infections, about 5%. And in terms of covariance of outcome, severity of infection um, uh, in univariate analysis um, uh, treatment was a factor that determined COVID severity, uh, but didn't pan out into um, a multivariate analysis. But in this series, uh, it did impact on uh, overall survival has a ratio of about 0 0.5. So um, overall survival about half as good in patients who were treated versus those that weren't treated, which does actually conflict with what we're seeing from a smaller um, UK series. But um, reasons for that may be different patients, different treatment, and also different sample sizes. Um, Vaccine responses. One of the questions that came up in the chat does um, uh, it uh, does what's the impact of treatment on vaccination? Because if vaccination works better, presumably infections will be less of an issue. And so, um, what we can see here, um, vaccine response by treatment. This is um, Helen Parry's data published this year. Um, can see that uh, treatment has a significant effect on vaccine response as measured by antibodies. So, um, antibody response only observed in about a third of patients treated with BTK inhibitors. On the left-hand panel, 
um, and about a quarter of patients treated with anti-CD20 antibodies on the right hand panel. Um, but what can be seen um, is that with time, um, things do get better. So in the middle panel, you can see that those patients who had previously been treated with BTK inhibitors and were off treatment, their vaccine response was about double those who were actively treated in a similar pattern seen with CD20 antibodies. Um, see, uh, this is all about serology. So this is antibody response. And what we know is that um, that's only part of the story. And so um, uh, Blood Cancer UK have been coordinating a lot of work that's been done around the country, looking at um, determinants of, anti of um, COVID severity. Um, antibody levels broadly um, reduce the frequency of infection. T cells reduce the severity of the infection. And so um, as we've seen with vaccinations, you may see T cell responses. Um, um, and as such, although patients are still getting infections, the severity of infections is reducing. But treatment is still a consideration here, but it certainly does something to um, reduce antibody levels and therefore in terms of the likelihood of catching an infection. So CLL treatment abrogates the efficacy of vaccination. Um, um, by um, in terms of antibody response, but the effect on T cells um, is uh, rather less certain and unfortunately in clinical practice not something that we can easily uh, monitor. And I think I'd just say we need to interpret the data carefully because it's a rapidly changing uh, field. Um, and when looking at um, numbers, thinking about um, when it was done, um, what type of virus we were looking at, what was the patient mix. Um, I think there was some early data to suggest that BTK inhibitor therapy might be protective because of the effect on the immune system. That is not true. Um, it doesn't make it any better, but equally it probably doesn't make it. BTK inhibitors are not the worst thing to have. And although COVID, we're living with it now rather than where we were two years ago, it is still something that's a consideration when thinking about choice of treatment and how to counsel patients um, when living with their CLL during um, COVID, which certainly hasn't gone away. Thank you, Adrian. That was excellent. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I will maybe start from John, actually, um, because John being on, uh, obviously, um, on all the therapies, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and I was just wondering, John, how your cycling being affected by treatment? What's your power like on ibrutinib versus venetoclax or when you cycle? Um... Okay. And any other points of the, the problems taking targeted therapy? Right. I um, started my ibrutinib in uh, 2014. And physically, I was at a low point uh, in physical capacity. And uh, I then I actually did a Macmillan Move More course. And that gave me the confidence to restart a certain amount of exercise. And Ibrutinib certainly put me in a position where I felt better. Uh, I, my, my, my physical capacity improved significantly, and therefore I started uh, getting back on a, on, on a bike and, 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 and doing things, uh, increasing distances and, and, and frequency of, 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 of cycling. But um, I, I think the fact that I was in a position to actually be able to exercise again was, was was great for my overall well-being and feel good factor. And did you find different? I mean, obviously, once you change from ibrut, because obviously, quite a lot of patients complaining of fatigue when they are on ibrutinib. Um, there are some patients complaining of on fatigue on venetoclax. I was just wondering whether your FTPs are different. <laughs> I, I, I I can't answer that one directly. But, but I do know, but in the most simplest terms, you know, I'm, I'm a battery. So I, I only ha have a limited amount of, of, of energy. And, and sometimes if I go for a long cycle, you know, 50, 60 miles, I will have a, a really good stews at the end of it. So, uh, so, so that's where, where I am. I, I, I don't know if that's, if that's typical though, or, or it's just me. No, but I think it's still so important to hear your, your, your experience. Um, so over to you, Adrian. Um, ben um, Kennedy um, posted, I think, sort of very important points. So we, um, when we were writing the GPP uh, guidelines for BTKI and high blood pressure, the ACE inhibitors are there and obviously ARBs are there and they are very important 
drugs to treat high blood pressure, vast majority of patients are on it. And obviously, as you alluded to about sudden cardiac deaths, and cur it's still currently, um, f any patients on flare are advised against starting ACE inhibitors. Although I have heard Professor Peter Hillman saying that maybe the fact that ACE inhibitors have been associated with the cardiac deaths because the, the, these were patients who needed pretty strong drugs to treat their hypertension anyway. So in a way, they were kind of higher risk patients. What, what's your impression on that? Um, I, I think there was a, as you say, when I was, there was a bit of, there was, there was, some, there was a, some concern from Flair that ACE inhibitors may be independently associated with this. My sense is that's kind of going away as a story. So um, it's not been observed elsewhere. Um, um, the drug company, so Janssen have looked at this and you know there's huge amounts of data now and I don't think anybody else has observed this. And I biologically, I'm not sure that there's any reason to think that it would be worse. So my take on it is it's probably an effect of hypertension rather than that the, the ACE inhibitor becomes a surrogate for, for, for high blood pressure rather than it being something that's truly down to the ACE inhibitor. So um, uh, you're right in the trial um, patients have still had to pause but I've I, initially I sort of got enthusiastic and thought we'll do it for everybody everybody else. I've not done that and I'm not aware that any of my colleagues are doing it say for those patients with mental cell and you know other, other, other reasons. So I, I think we may see more of it, but I think with um, with what came out from the data, it, 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 it may be just a, um, a, a, a non-causal association. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and what, what's your, um, are you worried about um, acalabrutinib and sudden deaths? Um, to some extent, I mean, I think we don't have the, the cardiovascular toxicity is definitely less. Hypertension is is is, is appreciably lower with with, with than um, than ibrutinib, and I suspect that we will see less of a problem it, it, as a treatment emergent side effect. It doesn't appear to be coming up, but it didn't, of course, with resonate. You know, when ibrutinib was first used, we had no data suggesting that there was um, uh, that this caused um, um, cardiac toxicity. So I think we need to be. Uh, mindful of it, that it may be something that will take some time to emerge as a toxicity, um, but I suspect there'll be less. But you know, it's only one percent with ibrutinib, and so um, you've got to study a lot of patients for a long time before um, you start this starts to uh, to come out. Okay, thank you, um, Helen. How how do you deal with the AF? So if somebody has got AF, do you tend to stop uh, ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, or do you persist regardless um well yeah i think that's really difficult so I, I would obviously talk to the patient about it um uh, and see if they had any strong feelings one way or the other i think we have tended depending on the patient on what their other risk factors are we have tended to continue the abrutinib um, once the patient's in af I, i'm not aware of any data that if you stop the abrutinib at that point that you you know they're necessarily going to come out of af just because you stop the abrutinib so i wouldn't necessarily stop it in the expectation it's going to make the af better um, so once they're in established af i'd be likely to continue the abrutinib unless the patient had a strong feeling otherwise and then obviously we've got the question about anticoagulation so obviously we need to be using a doac um, it was really interesting what agents presented in terms of the dual anti coagulant or antiplatelet therapy in the setting of a brutinib. We've had a few patients recently who have had to go on to a DOAC and an antiplatelet because of some um, combination of cardiac history or cardiac events. And those have obviously been the patients where we've then had to think carefully with the cardiologist, can we stop one of those safely or do we need to stop the brutinib in those patients because of the, the risk of bleeding of being on the three drugs simultaneously. But I think I would cautiously start my patient on a DOAC if they're in AF. Um, based on those scores, which I tend not to get into myself, but I tend to ask the cardiologists for their help and their assessment of the risk. Um, I would be trying to anticoagulate anti with, with a DOAC, but I'd be following the patient up really closely and really counselling them quite strongly about reporting any early bleeding symptoms in case we need to rethink our strategy before they have a significant bleed. Mm. And just back to Adrian, do you have, a, I mean, that's something what's intrigued me, you know, with all that long list of side effects, 
vast majority of side effects, including the, the problems with infection, just a waning with the, with the treatment. So past 12 months, you, you just get rid of aphralgias, uh, you know, rashes, etc. But yet the problems, the cardiac problems, AF and blood pressure still persist. Why is that? I don't know, to be honest, Renata, in terms of why that occurs. Um, but you're right. I mean, in terms of that, the, the cardiovascular toxicity is the thing, and that just gets worse and worse. The longer you, the longer you follow people up for, um, the worse it gets. Um, you know, there was a story about ibrutinib and what it might do in terms of the mechanism for cardiovascular toxicity or the hypertension in terms of kinase inhibition. Why that would get particularly worse or not, but I mean, that's I. I don't know is the answer, and I've not really seen anything that has convinced me one way or the other. And I don't know that it's all just simply an off-target uh, kind of interesting thing. I mean, did you have any? What do you think? <laughs> have you have you thought about this or or had any great insight into it? I, I I've not. I don't know. No, I've got to say. I, I was asking Janssen, You know, I, I asked them to sort of send me some kind of, yeah, because it's yeah. Why, why one works for one kinase is for one tissues and it doesn't yeah. for that particular tissue. And if, Helen and Eve, have you got any speculations you could offer? You know, we are we're not sort of restricted by licensing or sort of any any rules regulation. Come on, want you want to, want to hear your views? I don't I don't know the answer to that. I'm afraid. It's a good question. Don't know the answer. Yeah. I don't have any great insights to add uh, in terms of mechanisms of as, as why things like hypertension and the arrhythmia seem to behave differently to the other the other toxicities. <laughs> yeah, um, and Eve, um, in Oxford, yes, do you tend to give then O as an inpatient or outpatient? So we risk stratify people, and um, prior to COVID, the people who were high risk for tumor lysis syndrome had it as an in or had venetoclax as an inpatient. Um, since, uh, I guess with COVID, there was a push to do more as a day case. And then we, the ambulatory unit has, has extended its opening hours. So the high risk patient for tumor lysis patients now go through ambulatory care and the majority of our treatment is delivered as an outpatient. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. So the other thing is, I mean, if you've got somebody who's got huge tumor bulk, um, mm -hmm. I've overheard, I've, I've listened to once to a podcast uh, by Anthony Mater, and te he tends to give dexamethasone sort of five days in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you do that? Mm -hmm. We're uh, we're in process of, of reviewing our protocols this month and have an official day. And that's one of the, 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 the topics up for discussion to give people at highest risk of tumor lysis as sort of a you know, three to five day run in of dexamethasone beforehand to reduce both the, uh, I suppose, infusion reactions with abinutuzumab uh, and um, more so, I guess, more so than the tumor lysis because the venetoclax doesn't start till a few weeks down the line. Um, mm. The other, the other uh, I guess, there's a Canadian publication uh, looking at a, a slowing the rate of infusion for people who are based on their tumor lysis risk to try and minimize it or based on their tumor bulk to try and minimize their infusion reaction bulk. So, yeah, not our current practice not part of our current protocol but we've done it for individualized patients and probably will be part of the the, the 2022 local revision <laughs> right and and do you tend to stop the antihypertensive drugs before the obinutuzumab yeah i mean we ask the patients to sort of hold their medication the the day they're coming in for treatment you, you know and um, but not they no more than than that <laughs> mm. Okay, thank you. Um, so Adrian, um, you kind of alluded to study about um, stopping um, uh, ibrutinib to deliver vaccination. So Ben Kennedy saying, like methotrexate, should we interrupt BTKI um, as a to, for the COVID vaccine booster? Yeah, it's a good question. I guess Ben's alluding there to Helen's study that um, um, she's uh, doing, looking at this. So. Um, in uh, whether or not you can improve the um, response to vaccination. I don't think in somebody who is established on therapy, um, who's responded very well, pausing the treatment doesn't tend to cause any problems at all. They're not going to flare. It doesn't cause, it doesn't cause any issues. Um, and it might improve the response to vaccination. I, I, but it, it's a question that we don't know the answer to because um, it's... Uh, it's still that's that's a, that's a trial question. So, um, 
I have done when I've been asked. Um, I would say in my experience, a lot of my patients have just gone and been treated and I sort of find out they've been vaccinated after it's been done rather than anything else. But um, um, I don't think there's a reason not to and um, it, it, it may be beneficial, but we just need to see what the outcome of the study is. Yeah, and I, and obviously with the natural clocks, there is obviously there's no data, and people should continue yeah. with the natural clocks just to add yeah. as a comment. Um, Another, can I come yeah. in? There? One thing I've been doing in my practice is anyone coming for treatment in the next sort of month or six weeks or so to ensure that they're fully up to date with co, you know, whatever COVID boosters are eligible for before they start the treatment, so to get the maximum. Um, benefit from the vaccines. <laughs> yes, I mean that's especially if they've got CD20 as well, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. particularly if they've got CD20, um, come, uh, a chance to it. So the, so uh, Helen, um, there is a question from Dr. Bottomley, thank you for that, um, about severe purpuric rush on acalabrutinib. How do you, how do you manage that? And sort of any other tips for aphralgias, um, espresso for headaches, and uh, there is another question, sort of related question, um, uh, Dr. Danapal, any particular side effects are better with dose reductions? So is it, is it worth dose, reduction. dose reductions of BTKIs? So I think as Adrian sort of said during his talk, this, we've got really no dose, uh, we've got no evidence for the benefit of dose reduction in the setting of toxicity. And we know obviously from data, including um, George Follows, real world data that dose interruption, dose reduction, you know, does potentially have an adverse impact on outpatients, on, on patients, on BT carriers. So I think we want to avoid um, dose reductions, really, um, or dose interruptions. I think you mentioned headache, you cut out slightly during the question, but I think you mentioned headache. I mean, with a calibrutinib, I do tend to counsel patients that headache and diarrhea are certainly side effects, but that they tend to be transient. So I tell patients that a third to a half of patients might get a, I overstate it, um, might might get a headache um, with a calibration, but it does tend to be transient and just wear off after a few months and similar with diarrhea. Um, you said at the start, so you talked about a patient with a purpuric rash with a calibration. That's right. Um, so I think I'd be a bit worried. So uh, I'd obviously want to know, is the patient on any other anticoagulants, antiplatelets, any other reason they should be bleeding all those other additional things that Adrian mentioned, sort of over the counter things that might have a, you know, might be contributing to a bleeding risk. A purpuric rash feels a little bit worrying to me. It feels like a potential herald of some significant bleeding. So I think I'd want to see the, see the rash. If somebody's getting a purpuric rash, I'd want to look in their mouth and see if they've got blood blisters. Blood blisters. You know, is this a potential sorry, significant... Sorry, I'm checking pruritic rash. Oh, apologies. sorry, sorry. Apologies, apologies. Come back to something else completely then. Pruritic, apologies. right. Um, right, okay. Pruritic, it's not something I've seen with um, a calibration particularly. And so also, I, I mean, I'd... obviously, if it's allergy, that's like, oops, yeah, <laughs> do you want allergy I mean, here? No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd be starting with simple measures, you know, I'd be starting with simple measures, um, some topical steroid and some antihistamine and see how the patient, if it's if it's tolerable, obviously, if it's something the patient can't can't tolerate, then then we might have to discontinue the drug. Mm. But I'd be um, I'd be trying some simple supportive measures first and see if we can carry on and whether it just dies down like some of the other transient side effects, whether we can just push on through and keep them on the drug. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Um, Adrian, um, low molecular weight heparin, therapeutic dose, contraindicated with BTKI? No, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, you, you still might get bleeding with it, but um, it, it can be used and um, but um, not a great long term solution, I guess, for patients. I just coming on the last one. I mean, I think in terms of the, as as Helen's alluded to, uh, George's data definitely showed for the UK series. If you interrupt the dose, there was a huge uh, detriment to um, um, the long-term efficacy. Uh, dose reduction. I'm not. I, I think we probably there is there's less of a concern about mm. dose reduction in terms of its in terms of its effect on the efficacy. So there was some data published that showed equal efficacy for ibrutinib at, at, at all doses, 142, 80 and 420, which led to Janssen unhelpfully making the cost of all the tablets the same. Um, so, um, but I don't think we've got good data, but in the do what I do, do not what I say thing, I have in the past um, reduced the dose for things like um, it irks some things, tiredness, or just not tolerating it, or arthralgia, or and, and whether it's placebo or not, I've seen that some patients do seem to feel better. 
on a reduced dose. And I think it's about if you, if you can maintain treatment intensity, then it works um, rather than stop, start, stop, start. So I, I don't think that reducing the dose is to the detriment of patients, but um, it might. There isn't a great, there isn't really any, any great evidence to say that it's um, in any specific indication it's better. Okay. I would echo that, particularly yeah. for the people in the sort of 80 plus age group. Um, we have a number of those who have, in Oxford who have done well on relatively small doses of abrutinib or half doses of acalabrutinib and have run into bleeding issues on, on, on full dose and that's why we knock them back. <laughs> So yeah, we've got some. Uh, uh, we've got a question from anonymous attendee again. Thank you. Um, so about sub subdural hematoma. Um, so somebody sounds sounds like um, quite an unusual patient um, who developed severe te bleeding tendencies with acalabrutinib. Started with sudden petechiae, subcutaneous bleeding, um, and then subdural. Have you uh, have you come across something like that? Um, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, with with BTK inhibitors, then um, then, then you will see interest, inter, intracranial hemorrhage is, is a thing. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. it's small print in in the context. You haven't got nothing. If there's nothing else that's going on in terms of other in terms of other drugs, but can occur and is one and, and is dose limiting. Um, and that's certainly uh, an in, a, 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 a reason for not using BTK inhibitors. You can't do much better if it's happened, but equally, um, I definitely wouldn't be putting, I wouldn't be rechallenging that patient. Um, for somebody who's got sort of minor bruising and just it's a bit annoying, I think, you know, I echo Neve's point, it might try them again and just try, you know, playing around with the dose and see if you can get some treatment into them. But for that patient with that, I would say that it's most likely to be used the treatment and we'd be looking at a different class of therapy. Yeah. And I guess even um, Loxo would be obviously that that's become slightly out of the question. I presume now that that patient, that sort of complete group group of drugs, will be not available. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So um, now we definitely need a break. So.